turned on, so about 30 seconds you ought to hear it. Okay, um, we got one. Let me get the one over there for Jim, because... All right, let's come. Do we know who's in this live stream? I do not know who's in the live stream. I know basically who signed up, and, and there have been a few people who have, who have requested um, or sent in questions to Steve, and so we're seeing that. So those of you who are in the live stream out there, welcome. Um, those of you who are listening to this recorded, you may not actually hear what I'm saying now because this may actually get cut out when I do the editing of the recording um, because nobody needs to hear this in, in a recorded session. But what we do want to do is continue where we were this morning, which is talking about what's new in Paratext 8 since Paratext 7.5. Now, if you are out there in the world and you were using Paratext 7.0, or 7.2 or 7.3, there's probably a whole lot more that's new that we're not talking about. And so if you go to help, you can always look at help, what's new about Paratext, and you can look at what was new in Paratext 7.4, what was new in Paratext 7.5, what was new in each level to see what's changed. We're focusing primarily on what's changed from 7.5 to um, 7.5. 6 and 8.0. So the next thing we want to do, we want to, we were kind of talking about the word list and spelling. We want to talk a little bit more about what's new with spelling, with spell checking and such in Paratext 8. So if you would open up the MWEBFT project. And again, um, I saw a question came up of this in my email when I was at lunch. If you did not install the, um, this project, if you're on the live stream or if you're watching this in the videos, there is a link to a folder. Um, it's really strange talking to the people I'm seeing and trying to say this to people who are out in the sky, in the sky somewhere. Okay, it's, there's, a full, there's a list in the, in the description of the live feed. There's a folder there, <coughs> a link to a folder that has all these files. And under the projects to restore, you'll see that. For these people who are here, it's on your memory sticks. So open this up and navigate to Luke 1.6. So I'm going to flip back to Paratext so that I can do the same thing. In my case, I'm going to, all I want to open right now is the MW project. And I'm going to navigate to Luke 1.6. Okay, and in my case, I'm going to go ahead and turn off the highlight biblical renderings view just so that I get kind of a clean window. So, so I'm in Luke 1.6, and I have um, my MW project. Everybody with me? Okay, so what we want to do is we want to turn on spell checking. Spell checking has been available in... Um, in, in earlier versions, but we're going to turn it on here. There's a little icon that says ABC, display spelling, or you can go to checking, display spelling, either one of those two. So we're going to click that and turn it on. When you do that, when you do that, Paratext is going to go through a whole bunch of stuff and prepare the spelling. So you want to click on the icon that says display spelling, Display spelling, there's a little icon or under checking, display spelling. And you're going to see words that are underlined. Neil pointed out, I told you there were three things that highlighted in Paratext. This is a fourth highlight, okay? And this is very much like spell checking in Word or others, where it highlights words that it thinks or knows are misspelled. If you have not done any work at all in the word list, then it's, it, it's, going, to un, it's going to underline everything because everything's unknown, except it doesn't underline everything. What it underlines are the ones that it thinks the most likely are misspelled. And this is no different from what's happened before. So right-click 
on a word, right click on one of the words in one six that's underlined. Actually, in my case, I only have one that's underlined. So right click on that word that's underlined. And what happens? You get a correct spelling dialog. Okay. So if you right click on a word that is underlined, it brings up the correct spelling option. And so you've got a couple, we'll talk more about spell checking later, but it's, you've got a couple choices. Is this word okay or should it be something else? If it's okay, then you can just mark that it's okay and just click okay and you're done. And when you click okay, it's still underlined at the moment. That underlining will disappear eventually. Okay, now, look at the word righteous in verse 1 6, and there is no underlining here. But right click on it, and this is what's new. What's new in Paratext 8 is that you can get to the spell correction window from the right click. In Paratext 7, you could only get to the spell correction on words that were underlined. And if it wasn't underlined, you couldn't get to the spell correction. Now, you can spell correct any word. Okay, So, righteous isn't underlined, but you can right click on and click spelling, and it will immediately bring up the spelling options and you can decide what you want to do. Now it's not written in there, but in this case if I look I see the word righteous 297 times, so I could simply whoops, I could simply right click that, choose that as the right spelling, so now that's going to be my correct spelling, click OK, and so now I have indicated to the word list that that word is spelled correctly, even though it wasn't underlined. In the same way, if I came across a word that was misspelled, I could actually correct it with the spelling correction instead of simply marking, fixing it. Here's, here's the thing. When you're editing the text, if you come across a word and say, gee, that word were is spelled wrong. That's, that's supposed to be W-E-E-R-E. -E -E. It's, it's not spelled correctly. Well, the normal way to fix that would be just to fix it. Okay? So there, I've spelled it right. The problem is that if that's a consistent change that I want to make sure is done everywhere, I'm going to have to do that every time I come to that word. If I were to mark it instead with the spelling tool, if I were to mark it with the spelling tool and say the correct spelling is W-E-E-R-E, -E -E, now it's going to actually give me the ability to correct all 2,717 of those as I go through. Now, here's where you've got to be careful. Okay, when you're making changes, you may not want to change all 2,717 of them. Maybe this one is supposed to be where, you know, or, or the kind of the issue of four and four and four, or, you know, two and two and two. So you have to be careful with, with spell checking, correction, word list. But as you're going through this, Paratext now gives you the ability to correct words right as you're there. Okay, so this spelling comes up. Now, Spelling only comes up if you have turned on spelling. So if I turn off spelling and I right click on the word were, then spelling is no longer an option. Okay? Spelling is only an option if I have turned on display spelling. Okay? So if I turn spelling, display spelling off, I won't see it. If I turn display spelling on, then I will see it. Now there's another option here, and that's word list. 
And the difference between spelling and word list is that if I click on word list, then it does exactly that. It opens the word list to that word, okay? which is also really powerful. Okay? So as I'm looking at something and I come across a word and I say, hmm, I wonder where, what that is in the word list, then it's very powerful to say, okay, let me click on the word list and bring it up. But if you're going through and you're correcting spelling, and you see this is wrong, then it's possibly better, very often better, to use the right-click spelling and fix it for everything. Or, again, as you notice, when, you're, when you have that option turned on, if I turn on the spelling, da -da 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 I should have set something that did music when we're, when we're in pause I should have done music on the thing okay so if I right click on this word and do spelling one of the beauties of this tool is is that it gives me suggestions of what maybe this is supposed to be okay now again recognize that you've got to be careful that you don't want to change all occurrences of were to where but if I look at this particular word and say, oh, this is supposed to be where. Okay, what this is going to do is this is going to go back, and it's assuming that I've said that the word were should be where all the time. So it's going back to Genesis, and it's starting all 2,717 of these. I don't want to do this, so I'm going to cancel what I just did, if I have a case where just this word is supposed to be where, then I need to do it just manually right there. Is there okay. an undo feature if you hit change all by accident to undo it? There's history, and we will talk about history, but there is no undo function. There's no undo. Whoops. There's no, no, there's no oops, I messed that up. Notice that because I've said that were is supposed to be spelled where, it's now underlined. Because now I've told it that it's wrong. Paratext doesn't start with the default of underlining every word. So like in Word, typically if, you, if you've got a document in Spanish and you have English set as the language, then every word is underlined. Paratext doesn't do that. Paratext starts with the words that it thinks are most likely misspelled. But there's a, con a connection between the word list and, and the underlining that it, it, it tries to work. So, so this is not necessarily saying that these words are all spelled correctly. It's just guessing. It's guessing. And again, we'll spend more time talking about the word list later. But it's, it's taking a guess at what's going on. Okay, so what I want you to capture here, what's new, is again this feature that if you turn on spelling, then you can right click on a word that's not underlined, and you can mark it right or wrong. Okay, and so if you have a word that's consistently marked, you know this is misspelled and you know it should be something else, and no matter where it occurs like this, it should be this other thing, then you want to right click it and mark it wrong. Okay? If it's a word like, you know, this is supposed to be where instead of were, then you don't want to mark it and say were should be where, because it's going to try to change every were throughout the whole thing into where. Okay? So you have to know what it is you're doing and, and use it appropriately. Now, let's go to 2 Peter. Just go to the book of 2 Peter. And I'm going to turn off my spell checking. So one of the tools that was added, and I think it's in 7.5,
But one of the things that was added under checking is spell check the current book. This is a really useful tool if you're, you're working in the book of 2 Peter and you just want to spell check this book, you click spell check current book. What it does is bring up the word list and it goes through the word list running a series of checks. Paratext tries to be really, really smart running a series of checks on things that it thinks are most likely wrong. Starting with words that you've already marked wrong. Okay. So in my case, I marked the word were and said it's supposed to be where. So you can see over on the far right that it's got a that the X is marked is highlighted. So I've already said that word's wrong, and I've said what it's supposed to be. So that that's at the top of my list. Okay? When it spell checks this word book. It's saying these, this, this is most likely wrong. Okay, this was there in 7.5. Okay, if, you, if you never used it, this was there in 7.5. It puts the word that's most likely wrong, and then it starts putting words that it thinks might be wrong, okay, based on an, an analysis that it does where it goes through and it analyzes and says, okay, we've got this word severant, and severant is spelled S-E-V-R-A-N-T once, and 604 times it's servant. So it's saying, gee, statistically, I don't think that's right. Now, if it's correct, if it's correct, then you would simply click on the check mark and say, nope, Sevron's right. That's the way we, that's the way we say a Sevron in, you know, if he's in the book of Peter, you know. <laughs> I had a translator tell me once, he said, well, for Peter wrote one way and Paul wrote another, so we spell things differently. I don't buy it. I don't, I don't think that's a good answer. I think it's better to be consistent throughout the whole New Testament. But, you know, but, but, but yeah, it was the British, it was the British, it was the British spelling. It was the British, it was the British spelling. Okay, so, so, um, but, but it puts the word... Most spell. Again, this is this is the way spell check worked forever. This is this there's no, nothing different here. Okay. And we're gonna talk more about this process later. And we're gonna spell check, we're gonna correct this. Don't correct it all now. You're gonna that's gonna be your job later to correct it. Um, but what's different about Paratext 8 is this. If you go to tools spell check, it used to be in 7.5 there was a single entry, spell check. That was all you had. Now, if you go to spell check, what you have is a whole series of possible checks you can do. Okay? These checks, these checks are based on words that are marked unknown or incorrect. If you were to go to your word list and mark every word correct, then it wouldn't find anything here. Okay? It only finds things if they are unknown or incorrect. So this is a tool you want to use before you go through and mark everything right. Okay? One of the questions that came up earlier was about capitalization. Okay? Well, one of the individual checks you can do is missing capitals. So the spell check current book just ran everything. It just ran it all. If I run missing capitals, then I get a different list, a much smaller list, of issues that are dealing with words that are currently set to lowercase, but in theory might need to be capitalized. So let's, let's take a look at it. Okay, so if you're in the word list, the word list came up. So let me, let me, back, let me, let me back it up again. I'm going to close back to where I was. I'm, I'm in just my main window, and I have my project, and I click Checking, Spell Check Current Book. And when I do that, it opens up the word list. Okay? 
in the word list, there is a tools menu. And this is where it gets confusing because they say open tools. Well, this is the word list tools, not the main tools. In the word list, there's a tools menu. And in that tools menu, there's a spell check. And that spell check has a whole bunch of choices. And one of them is missing capitals. You with me? OK. So amen. Should amen be always capitalized? You guys are the translation team. What do you say? How many say yes? How many say no? How many don't care? Depends on the context. Depends on the context. I got one person who says it depends on the context. David, you said no. Depends on the context? That's at the beginning of the sentence. Okay. So, so in that case, amen is fine. Amen is fine. So I'm going to just click and say amen is okay. I'm going to click on the green check box and say amen is okay. What about God? Should God always be capitalized? No. Okay. Now, here's a place where I agree. I agree. God should not always be capitalized. Sorry, Lord. Um, but, but if you leave it lowercase, you have no way of checking whether it's which way it is. Now, you can do it by just looking for all the ones that are lowercase and see if they're right. You also could look at all the ones that are uppercase and see if they're supposed to be lowercase. Ultimately, this is a place where you're going to have to read it. Okay? You're going to have to read it. But, but if, if you say, well, yes, it actually should be God with a capital, and you'll notice that Paratext is giving two choices. One is all caps God or just capital G God. I'm going to choose capital G God. And notice now that it's happy. That's because God in 2 Peter is always capitalized. But if we were to change our filter up there from 2 Peter to the whole Bible, we would find it says that there are some that are no longer capitalized. And then we could say, show us the ones that are incorrect and find the ones that are lowercase and say, yes, those should be lowercase. They're okay. We're going to be okay with that. We're going to be okay with the fact that there's some errors, errors there because it's intentional. What about hell? Should hell always be lowercase or uppercase? Probably lowercase is okay. Could go either way. What about the word I? I should always be uppercase. So, again, when I'm looking at the words and saying, well, this is wrong, I can either mark it wrong and say what it should be, but if it offers me a suggestion, I can click on the suggestion and say that's good. And notice that it's happy because normally it is always uppercase. Okay, what about Lord? Should Lord always be capital? Not always. It's a little tricky because sometimes it's sort of like God where maybe you'd want to know where is it lowercase. What about Savior? Right. So you've got these, these issues of, you know, how are you dealing with it? Should it be all caps? So some of these are tricky. But, but here's a tool that brings that forward. It allows you to focus on just these issues of capitalization and focus on that. Okay, let's look at another tool here in the spell check. So that was missing capitals. You could look at, for instance, single character typos. Okay, so this is going to be a little bit longer list probably, especially since I put more typos in. So now, now we see some words that differ by a single character. Okay. What about the first one? Is it right or wrong? Now, how do you know? Do you know the context of that sentence? How do you know? How do you, in English it's not, but do you know that in this language that's not spelled right? But what if this is a what if this is a, a, a Gullah or something? Could it be spelled that way in Gullah? 
Thank you. Thank you. If you don't, don't simply look at the words and say, oh, that's wrong. Click on the, the word, click on the word that's in black and look at the context. Now when I see it, I agree, Mary, that's not right. Okay? But I need to see the context before I make a decision of what this thing is. Okay? When I see it's wrong, again, I can either mark it wrong by clicking the X, or in this case, it's telling me the right word, and I see that servant is the right word, so I can just click it. Now, because this word actually exists in the text when I'm correcting it, it's going to bring me to this standard window that lets me choose whether I want to correct it or not. I've got four choices. Yes, I want to make this change. No, in this case, I don't want to make the change. Yes, I want to change all of them. If there are 15 of them, I want to change all of them. Or, you know what? I think I just messed up. Cancel. Okay. When you mark cancel, it will still be marked as wrong, and it will still be marked that sir, I didn't even say the word, Sevrant, becomes servant. Okay. But at least you're canceling out of changing it. So rather than clicking yes to all and then saying, oops, I need to undo it, if you're not sure, cancel. Okay. But I'm sure that that's what it should be, so I'm going to say yes. Now, in this spell check, the moment you say yes to something, it goes through and it processes everything again because you've just given it new information that it didn't have before. You've just told it that the VR becomes, or the RV becomes VR. So if there were other words that had this same combination, all of a sudden now it's looking to say, oh, do we need to fix this? Okay, so when you make a change, it runs again. So for some people, they don't like this tool because every time they do something, it takes so long. And especially if you've got a whole Bible, if you're looking at the whole Bible, and you go, oh, I've got to do this again. It would make changes. Well, the current book, the current book, no, no. It will make changes to everything. Because remember when we were looking at the, the other thing with the, the word that I was spelling, it, it actually went back to Genesis. So it, it, will, it will correct. It will, if it finds a word that's wrong, it will correct it everywhere. So then what's the difference between yes and yes to all? Yes and yes to all is yes does it for that particular word that's showing right then at that moment. And yes to all would just say, okay, just go ahead and do it for everybody. So that word in that context. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So what about linger? It's offering me two suggestions, linger, finger, and longer. All of those differ by a single character. Just look at it to make sure. Good point. So from now on, from now from of old doesn't longer. Nope. Doesn't finger? Nope. Doesn't linger? Yeah, linger is the right word. So I can mark it correct. So again, this gives me a way to go through. We're not going to correct all these right now. You can play with it later. There's problems inserted for later spell check. But the, the, the objective is to use these tools to allow you to see certain particular things. So when I'm looking at this, Again, I can run all the checks at one time. I can look just for missing capitals, just for single characters. Unusual letter combinations. What's an unusual letter combination? Well, VR, VR or RV, or you know, some, you know, TN, TNY, or you know, something, some combination that's just strange. Part of that is Paratext learns that as you give it more information. So Paratext learns about your spelling as you correct things. So the more you correct things, the more it learns, the better able it is to help you um, find it. Diacritic errors have to do with accents and things that are put on words. Common typos, again, that's a thing that's learned as you correct. So if, if you came to the word T-E-H and changed it to T-H-E, then Paratext would start saying, hmm, E-H may be a typo. So it may start looking for E-Hs and say, okay, well, here's another one. Where, you know, is this wrong? So you correct that one to H-E. This says, okay, so that, that's common. So, it start, so common typos are something that as you correct things, Paratext says, okay, well, this is the way you've corrected it, so this probably should do it. 
This is why it's better to make corrections in the spelling or in the word list so that paratext can learn what the right spellings are and it can help you with other words than for you just to go to the editing and just change it. Especially if you know you consistently type, up, type something incorrectly. Like sometimes I find myself always putting in an H in with W-H-I-T-H and it's just a typo. Yep. And so if you correct it enough times, paratext will start figuring that out. Mm -hmm. Yes. I was wondering if this might be a feature request. If they could highlight the part that they're, like Apostle, if they're highlighting some combination in there that, because some people just go so fast that they don't say, oh yeah, I should have looked at it closely. And they just say, that looks fine to me. And they maybe have trouble with dyslexia. Well, this is one of the reasons, one of the reasons why they offer you these pairs. They're not just putting the word A-P-O-T-S-L-E up there, they're putting it in conjunction with a suggestion. So in this particular view, they're always offering you a suggestion as to what it should be. Um, and so, you know, highlighting it's tricky. They, you know, and again, we certainly could do that. One of the issues with some things like that is, is that it makes the program so much more complicated that, you know, it's almost not worth the, the time. But certainly something, you know, you can always make the suggestions as to what should be there. Okay, so we're looking at these, so all these choices are available. But again, if you say, you know what, I just want to check everything, then you hit all checks, and it's going to go out, and it's going to give you this big old list of a bunch of words that it thinks are wrong, and you can just work your way through that. Okay, so as you're spell checking, now, notice that it's only telling me at the bottom, telling me there are nine words. The way this tool works is that when you finish down here, you come to a nice thing that says, more items available. <laughs> okay? So, Paratext doesn't try to give you 500 words at once to work on. It gives you nine or so words and says, okay, fix these. When you're done with those, you click more and it says, okay, here's some others. Okay, here's some others. Again, it's looking at the words that are most likely misspelled. It's trying to find the ones that have the most reasonable chance of being misspelled first. And then it's going to gradually work to ones that are less likely. And then you start getting to ones and say, well, no, these are all right. Correct, correct, correct. Okay. So when you're using this particular tool, you want to look at when there's more words available. You gotta, you gotta work on some, yeah. You gotta work on some. But again, you can see, like the word eyewitnesses isn't putting anything as a suggestion because that's one that probably is based on um, a strange combination. You know, it's looking at SS and saying, well, SS is a strange combination, so it's, it's putting it in, but it's not offering you any suggestion. Right, and so we are currently, we are currently up at the top, it tells me we're in spell check all checks. So it's telling me what we're looking at. Below that, I've got filters that are shown, and then it says close spell check all checks and show all words. So if I want to get back to my full word list, I can click that link. That takes me back just to the regular word list. I still have a filter on, I'm still looking at Second Peter, and I'm looking at incorrect and unknown words, but you know, I can get around that. Now, while we're looking at this, one of the things that opened up when I did all checks was this view of the morphology. Okay. So the morphology kind of opened up automatically, but this is another new feature in Paratext 8 that I can actually spell check by morphology. Now in Paratext 7.5, I could check the morphology. I mean, the morphology was available to me. Does somebody, would somebody like to give a brief, what, what's morphology? Part of a word is less than a whole word. Okay. 
breaking its word into its parts. So when we talk about the morphology of something, we're talking about breaking it into parts. And their meaningful parts. And their meaningful parts. Well, so like a chord and the ing on the end of it, it has a meaning, you know. Um, so, you know, when we, when we break words apart, we break it. Some, and, and some of our languages are very glutinative. There are lots of parts in them. Others are, are, you know, basically just individual words. So how much morphology you have kind of depends on your language. But one of the things that happens in Paratext 8 is you have a feature called spell check by morphology. So if you go to tools, if you go to tools, there is a feature there that says spell check by morphology. And when you click that, what it does is it shows us the morphology of the words. I'm still on 2 Peter. I'm going to switch this to all books just so I get more data. Okay. It shows me all of the, the words. I'm going to go down to the word, or I'm going to find the word quarrel. Oops, I've got to get out of there. Go to the word quarrel. Okay. Okay, so when I look at the word quarrel, I, I see the place for breaking this up some, for the word quarrel. The word quarrel, quarrel itself is, is probably the root. I probably can't break quarrel into anything. So when I'm looking at that word, I would click the checkbox to say quarrel by itself is right. Quarrel by itself is right. But notice that when I clicked that green checkbox, what happened to the other options for quarrel. They already switched off the ED, the ING, and the S because earlier when I had been working on this, I had broken ING off as an affix. I'd broken ED off as an affix. So if I've told paratext that ED is an affix, then when it comes to another word that has ED on the end, it will no, to break it off. That's why it didn't break off some. That's why it didn't break off some because I've never, I've never done a word that had some. Okay, um, and so like if I click on the word quarters down here, if I look quick on quarter, then quarters automatically got broken, but master didn't. Okay, because I've never dealt with master. So paratext requires me to do some work. Maybe, if, if I, okay, so now because I'd already clicked on quarter once, quarter is, is red, it's a guess, okay, it's not been approved, but it's a guess, but um, now what happens is with this spell check, the way this tool works is that it grays out the words that it thinks based on our morphology Based on our morphology, it, it says, okay, well, this, this is probably a valid word. This one's a probably valid word. This one's probably valid. And so it, it starts to hide the words that we've approved. If I refresh this list, if I refresh the list, now you'll notice, again, I'm still looking at quarter. Now you'll notice that those words that I had, the one that I had approved was quarter, but all the ones that the morphology were guessed on have disappeared. And so it's leaving me words that I can work with. Now, something important here. It is not marking those words valid. Okay? It's not marking those words valid. All it's doing is hiding the words, or sh it's showing me the words that it thinks based on morphology, are still misspelled. Uh-huh. When I meant to click on quarter, I clicked on quarters instead. Okay. Now how, I, how do I get it back to the way it was? Okay. Click on quarters again. Okay. So let, let me 
show basically how you do the morphology because this is what um, Pat's going to do. So this word quarrelsome or quartermaster, let's do quartermaster. If I say, okay, I need to break this, when I click it, one, we didn't talk about this as, a, as part of our help, but when you open a lot of windows, you'll see a little yellow box. And that little yellow box is a lot like the guides. This is really important. It's got a lot of important information. It tells you how to mark a word. To mark an affix, you put a plus, either before it or after it. If it's a prefix, you'd put the plus after the, the part, un, plus. If it's a suffix, you'd put it in front, so plus ed. Okay. But in the case of quartermaster, these are really two roots. right? So I'm just going to put a space. And so what I end up with is two roots. Roots are always shown inside of, I guess for you it would be this one, um, are inside of the diagonals. Okay. So quartermaster is made up of two roots. So if you accidentally miss up, mess up the, the um, morphology, basically if you click on, click on the word again, you simply change it by going in and typing. So you'd put a plus to show affix. Now what we're saying is that quarter is the root and master is a suffix. Well, that's not really true. Master's not a suffix. Master's a, a root, right? It's a compound. So again, I need to simply click it and take off the plus sign to say that these are two roots. So the, the, the object of this tool is, is to leave you with the words that are most likely errors based on the morphology that you've set. So it slowly starts breaking it down and leaving you with words that you need to check. Okay? It's also important for your internalization. Also important for your internalization. So you can work on the morphology. Some people would work on the morphologies by opening the word list and working on the morphology. But if you turn on this spell check by morphology as you're doing that, then it starts hiding the words that it already suspects are right. Okay. Now again, it's not marking these words right. So if I were to um, come back into my filter and take off quarter, okay, you know, because I'm spell checking by morphology currently, it's still hiding those words. But I turn off spell checking by morphology, and go down Q, R, Q, 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 P. Not a lot of Qs in here. Is there a faster way to get to lower things on the list? Yes, using the filter. <laughs> well, actually, find. The filter works, but you can also use fi or edit, find. So if I put edit, find, and put quarter, I'm already there. It finds it, okay, and then I can switch. So now, now that I've done this, now I might want to go through and say, okay, yes, this is marked right, you know, and I might want to prove them um, as I'm going through. But you'll notice that, again, some of these, the morphology hasn't been approved, so they're guesses. So if this is correct morphology, then I would want to approve it and say that's correct. Okay, so spell check by, by morphology is one of the other new things in the word list tool. So you don't check the, the, check, the bottom green checks and the column on the right? Well, if I'm, if I'm spell checking, then I'd also want to check these and say, yes, OK, those are right. But what we're, what we're looking at is simply the morphology at the moment, so I wasn't checking that. We're going to talk about spell checking and some of the other tools, the hyphenation and things. We'll talk about that later in the week. But what I want you to capture is, is that this feature of spell check by morphology allows you to narrow your list down based on the morphology. So if you've got a, a, a language with lots of affixes, then this is one way to try to locate the words that might not be spelled correctly 
because they don't have affixes that, that fit in the morphology. I hope that sounded like I really knew what I was talking about. And, you know, I won't tell you that I really don't. Okay, any questions on that? Um, did you cover the question mark on the left column? Did I cover the question mark on the left column? So, so the, the, the question mark column, I should have just brought up the word list. The question mark column, this one, yeah. which is a place where it allows me to write a discussion note okay. about a particular word. So we did, you know, we talked about that earlier, that I could write a note. So, so if I'm on this word were, and I say, okay, I'm not sure about that, then this might be a place I'd want to write a note and say, okay, we need to talk about this. What are we going to do about this word? Now, since I happen to be here, this is a place where, what do I do with this? What do I do with this thing? I've got it marked as wrong, and it keeps telling me to apply the correction. I'm not sure this is wrong. So what should I do? <laughs> Question mark. So one, one good option is to go back and say, this word is unknown. So instead of saying it's wrong, I'm going to say it's unknown. So that's one option. Is that the question mark you're talking about? Okay. So I mark it unknown. And then the other thing is, is that I might want to go ahead and double click and add a note and say, we need to talk about this. Okay. I don't necessarily even have to put anything here. I could just put a question mark, if I knew where my question mark was. I could just put a question mark. I need something to create a note. Now I have a note there that Remember, I can filter this for all the ones that have notes to go back and look at this again. Because I've actually got thousands of words that are unknown. Okay, So I've got thousands of words that are marked with a question mark here. This is one that I truly want to discuss with people. So having a note there, even if it's just a question, might, again, trigger for me what I need to do. Okay. Okay. There's two ways. Let me let me go back. I'm going to get myself to where I'm in the word list with all books. And so I have all books on in my filter and I turned off the special spell check. So I'm just I'm looking at the whole word list. There's two ways to to get to a particular word. One is with the filter. So if I go to filter text and type quarter Open your window. It's just a box. Okay, type in it. Okay. I love compute. I love computers. I love computers. Close spell check for morphology and so on. Yeah, close spell check for morphology. Okay, now. What version of Paratext is it? Okay, well, I'm not sure why it's not, but that's but one way to, to do this filter, you might want to close the word list and open it again just to make sure it's not set wrong. But um, so to see the words that have notes on it, I would go to the filter and say, show unresolved spelling discussions. One way to find a particular word is to put a filter on it. Another way to find a word is to use edit find. And what edit find does, instead of filtering the list down, it actually just goes to that word in the list. Okay, so when I search, it actually just goes to that word, and so I can 
so in this case, I'm still seeing the whole list. It hasn't filtered the list. It just goes to that word. Okay. So find, find will take me to a word. Filter reduces the list down to that set of characters. All right. The next thing we want to look at is the new parallel passage tool. How many of you have used parallel passages? What? It's new, the new one's annoying at times? No, the, old one. the old one. Okay. In parallel passages, in Paratext 7.5, basically you would get this list and you just had to dig through it. Okay. In Paratext 8, they've added some new features that make it really useful. So let's get to it. I'm going to close my word list. I've got my MW project open. And I'm going to go to Tools. Parallel passages. Tools, parallel passages. And click that, and it opens up the parallel passage tool. Now, in this case, I'm going to just leave it on top because I want to see the whole screen. But again, I've got the always on top pin. So if I wanted to, to change the size, I could do that. Um, this is a lot of information. OK. <laughs> So what this is telling me is that 2 Peter 1, 2 is parallel to all those different books. Okay? There's parallels in all those different books. The way the parallel passage tool now works is that at the top, in the top pane, you have a list of references that relate to the filter that you're using. So let's look at our filters. Our filter says all references in the current book. And it says all parallels. What choices do I have? Well, current book, again, is similar to the other ones we've done. And one of those choices, now remember when we saved our filters before, we saved the four Gospels and the five T's. So those, because they're project related, are still available to me in this new tool. So even though I did it in the word list, those are available. So I'm going to go to the four Gospels. Okay. And you'll notice that now, even though I'm in Peter, and even though what's showing up at the bottom currently is still Peter, nothing's changed because I haven't clicked anything, I'm actually in Matthew. So if I click on a reference, then it changes and it shows me that particular reference. Now there's a lot of information being shown here. In the bottom pane, it's showing me Matthew compared to Isaiah in the Greek and in the Hebrew. Well, there's no Hebrew for Matthew, so it's not showing me anything in that pane. For the Greek, it's showing me the Greek for Matthew and the Septuagint, Greek for Matthew. And then it shows me the text of my project. Okay. But I also can show other things. Now, how many of you read Hebrew and Greek? Okay, so a couple of you raised, one, one hand went really high, a couple of hands, hands kind of creeped up. Who admits it? Who admits to reading Hebrew and Greek? Okay. Or, can you say or, not or Hebrew or Greek. Okay. Yeah. How many of you read Greek? Okay. So, depending on what parallels you're using, this may or may not be useful to you to have the Hebrew and the Greek showing. Okay. Up here in the top, I have an option of turning on the Hebrew, Greek, and gloss. There are three choices Hebrew, Greek, and gloss, Hebrew, Greek with no gloss or no Hebrew Greek. So now I've just turned off the Hebrew Greek. So if I don't read Hebrew and Greek, and I really don't want to work with those glosses, I can just turn it off. Now ideally, you probably want to have those on. But if you don't read the Hebrew and Greek, they're not going to mean much to you. Would you still like the comparative text instead? Ah, I heard a question. Can you use comparative text instead? Well, right next to Hebrew Greek, there's another option here that says comparative text. So 
Now, which comparative text do I want to open up? Well, basically, every text that I have on my computer can be used as comparative. So if I've got some text that somebody else did, I could use it. If I want to use the NIV, I could choose it. I can choose any text or resource that I actually have on my computer. So just because I have it, I'm going to choose Darby. Comparing English to English isn't necessarily all that exciting, but that's what I'm going to do. OK, so now I've got the Darby. And the Darby is a text that we're going to say is, is well done and totally correct and accurate. And we're confident that the parallels in the Darby are what we want to follow. This is where it, what really becomes important for the comparative text. Because one of the questions with parallel passages is, are all parallels the same? I mean, the fact that we say it's a parallel passage, does that mean that they're exactly the same? No. No, they're not going to be exactly the same. They're going to change depending on what you've got. So, um, so what's going to happen is you're going to look at the, the two texts here and say, OK, yeah, this parallels, this parallel. I'm reading this text and this text. These both look OK to me. I'm happy with these parallels. If you're happy with, if you're happy with them, what's new in Paratext 8 is the ability to check it and say, yes, I'm happy with these two parallels. Notice that what happens is when I check them, they turn green in the main list, and they've got a green check mark to say that that's been approved. Okay. There's another filter up here at the top that instead of seeing all references, I can say, just show me the unchecked references. And so now, that particular set of choices is gone, because I've already approved it. And so I can move to the next one. And I move to the next one. I say, OK, yep, those look OK. Good. Actually, it doesn't take it completely out of the list yet until I, I move on. But so I can keep moving down the list and approving the, the comparison. Now, when I come to one and I say, mm, no, that, that one doesn't do it. That one's not right. I have the ability to edit the text right here by clicking on the edit window. And it opens up the text. Now, that could mean that what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight the text here. Okay, So here we have forgiveness. Here we have remission. And it looks like it's remission in both. So I'm going to highlight both all that text, right click it, or just do Control C to copy it, and then go to Edit. And very carefully paste it in. Say OK. Now I've made them parallel. Again, this is a dangerous thing to do. Let me tell you. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters. Don't do this carelessly. Don't do it carelessly. Okay, it's really easy to go through and say, oh, this is right. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. Boom, 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 boom. Check, 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 check. These are OK. Good, 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 good. This is a tool that's very powerful. Okay? The, fact that, the fact that these are the same in another translation doesn't necessarily even mean that they should be the same in your translation. Because depending on how you write your words, you might have to add a different ending to a particular word. And so this one's going to be a little different simply because it's got a different ending on it. Okay? So be very careful with just saying copy paste. Okay? Um, but this gives you a tool that very quickly you can look at these and say, yes, we've, we've got these in a parallel form. So you approve them. Okay. Now, the translator. So do they go into heaven once you approve them, you'll never see them again? They go to heaven, you'll never see them again, unless you show all, all references. Again, you can, you're filtering. So when you're filtering and saying, only show me the ones that are unchecked, 
then you're seeing those. But if you want to see all of them, you just say, show me all references. In this project, uh, we lost the window, but in this project, 4 7 is red, and my list is cut across blue. Okay, well, we'll get there in just a second. So, okay, so the translator goes back to this verse, and he's looking at Mark, and he says, oh, remission's not right. That should be forgiveness. Okay, good. He's fixed it. We're all happy. Okay, he saves it. He does a send receive, he sends it to us. Now, somebody goes back to the parallel passages, and all of a sudden, this passage that used to be right now shows up in our list again, and Mark is in red. And Mark has a question mark next to it, and you'll notice that it also has a little AB to the left of edit, okay, which tells me that something in that verse has changed. Now, you guys know what's changed because you just sat and watched me do this. But pretend, if you would, that you hadn't seen me do that. You had no idea what had changed. Okay. How can you know what's different? Well, that's what that little AB symbol is for. And this little AB shows up in a number of places in Paratext 8. When you click it, what it does is it opens this beautiful window called Compare Text, and it shows you what has changed. It says that it used to be remission, and now it's forgiveness. But is it only showing what has changed since the time you approved it? Yes. Yeah. It's showing what's changed since you approved it. So when you approved it, from that time till now, that's what it's showing us. Since it was made, right. So it's some, something was it's changed since it was done. So I'm going to go back. So now I know. Now I know what's changed. I know that remission in this verse became forgiveness. Okay, it used to be remission. So now I start looking at this and saying, okay, well, it was remission there, it was forgiveness there. But you know what? In our translation, we're going to use forgiveness there. So maybe we need to go and change remission to forgiveness over here and then approve both verses again i can't say what you're going to do in your translation <clears throat> maybe you need to change forgiveness back to remission maybe you need to change them both to forgiveness maybe you're going to say you know what in this case they're different but we're going to approve both of them those are decisions that you as the team are going to make but paratext is giving you the tool that lets you see what's happened and that didn't exist before. Okay? That didn't exist before. Now you have a tool to see what's going to happen. <clears throat> if I come back in here and edit this and change it back to remission. No control X. Okay, notice that as soon as I change it back, Paratex says, okay, you're, you, you have it the way you had it before. We're happy. We're happy. Okay. Is an undo, undo exists, but I'm not sure if it exists there. Again, one thing you can do is try. Um, one of the things that happens, you know, it, when you have a question like that, just try it. See if it undoes. If it doesn't undo, then it probably doesn't exist there. Undo does exist, undo does exist in some situations, but not always. Okay, now, you'll notice that there are some places like Matthew 4, 7, where it's got the verse in red, and it's got a line through it. And it's got an X on that reference. Okay, so I'm going to go to edit to see what's happening. And when I go to edit to see what's happening, I notice that verse 7 says, 7 Jesus. You've got to say it really fast. 7 Jesus. It's not 7 space Jesus. It's 7 Jesus. And there is no verse 7 Jesus. If you remember when we were looking at the project plan, it said there were some errors in chapter verses. Before I do anything else in paratext, I should make sure there are no errors in the chapter verses. Because what happens is things like this, where this verse, there was an error, and this verse doesn't even exist as far as paratext is concerned. So my word list isn't checking it. You know, my parallel passages aren't checking it. 
So before I did anything else, I should go back and clean all that up. Again, we're going to deal with that later, but that's why it's happening. So if I fix that verse and make it 7 space, now all of a sudden the verse shows up. The challenge, and this is where the it does highlight it if I run the check. Yeah. So if I run the chapter verse check, it highlights it seven Jesus. It would have highlighted that. Okay. The problem is I can't highlight it in every single context that might exist. And in this case, it just it's telling me this. I can't find it. I don't know what's going on. But so this again, I want to just stress, you know, in for those who are working in paratext, that the first thing you need to make sure is you have no problems with your chapter verses. That, that's just essential, because if you have problems with your chapter verses, then nothing else really works the way it's supposed to. I was just going to say, that's the importance of making sure that, the, I mean, that's why the, in, the, in the program plan thing, you can't go on to the next stage until that is done. And it's done. And that's why you want chapter verses need to be checked early, 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 early on. Okay. Did you get that? Early, early on. Okay. Um, okay, we're going to look at that real quick, and then I'm, we're not going to do any more of these corrections right now. <clears throat> okay, when I open up to 1617, what's the problem here? We're not, we're not sure, because that could be that that's supposed to be 6 and that's supposed to be 7, or maybe that's supposed to be 16 and 17. I'm not quite sure, but obviously there's a problem with the verse. We'll deal with that later when we deal with checking. I, I, it's hard to put all the errors in all at one time. We don't want to fix everything. Don't fix everything yet, but um, just note that there's an error there. Um, so, but yes, it's going to show errors simply because it can't get there. So, again, capture in the new parallel passage tool that you, you have a, these lists. You can mark things as correct so you can keep track of what you've done. You can... Um, find what's changed since you've done it. But again, going back to the list, we didn't really look at all these filters. In the filters, we've got a list that shows us all references or unchecked. I can look for ones that have changed text. So rather than having to look at the list, I could say, show me all the ones that have changed text. Well, none of my problems have changed text anymore. What about missing text? Ah, here's a bunch of them that have missing text. Okay, so by this method, I can find all the ones that have missing text. When I'm looking at the parallels, I can choose every parallel that exists, or I can say, only show me the New Testament to New Testament parallels, only the New Testament to Old Testament, Old Testament, Old Testament, or Synoptic Gospel. So I can choose which set of parallels I want to look at, okay, and be, very, be more specific about finding a particular set of parallels. And I think that's as far as we're going to go in looking at what's new in the parallel passage tool. Any question here? Comment? Yeah, a question. In our, in our final Bible, we had a, a little uh, story there going on in the total about something that happened, then it, it backed up and said this happened because these things had happened before. But in the actual Nopana, for them to understand it, you had to put it in sequential order. So we uh, took the passage, the verse numbers out, and put this is from 6 to 20. Or right. Something. So you're not going to be able to use the parallel passage tool very easily because, because you don't have some comparative text. I mean, so what would happen is if someone else was going to do a, uh, they were going to do a Bible in Uganda that was based on the Nafanra, then, and you were comfortable with their parallels, then he would open up your text as comparison and say, okay, 7 to 20 should have these parallels. Okay? But again, it's probably less helpful if you've done a lot of resetting and remote moving things around. It's not, yeah. but, but, but again, one of the keys, one of the things is to take your text. Sometimes you don't want to take a text that you've already typeset and run it through this because you go, oh, how did we miss that? Oh, what? Oops. Okay. But, you know, sometimes it's, it's helpful to look at the text you know and to go through this process. 
Okay, we've got time for a couple more items here. I know some people have to leave at 3. One of the new things in Paratext 8 is the way Paratext 8 uses, whoops, I didn't mean to close Paratext completely now. The way Paratext 8 uses references. In, you, you've always been able to put scripture references in. I mean, obviously, you know, you've got scripture references. There's a couple places where they're very common. One is, is in the parallel passages in the sense that when you're in Matthew, for instance, you're in the Gospels, and you're in Matthew under a section on the, the prodigal son, it says Mark 3, you know, 15, 2, and it says parallels to those other, other passages. Okay. Those references, when you're in 7.5, don't do anything. But in 8, they actually become live. So let's open up this project again, which is open, and let's go to Mark chapter 3. Okay, in Mark 3, put your cursor at the end of Mark 3 and type backslash R space Matthew or MAT 313. So you want to type at the end of 3, type MAT 313. Okay, so you're going to type Matt 313. I'm going to turn off my highlight invalid characters now because I don't want it all highlighted in invalid characters. Okay. So I'm going to type backslash R space MAT 313. Everybody got that? Okay, and you should have a little icon in front of Matt 313. What does that tell you? What does the icon tell you when you hover over it? Okay, invalid book, is that what it says? Okay, invalid book. Okay, one of the things that Paratext 7.6 and Paratext 8 does is it actually checks your, some of your references as you're going, if they're in a certain context. So it will check things that are marked with a backslash R or backslash SR or MR, all the, the references. It will also check things that are in the X field, the XT field, okay? So there's a number of things that get checked automatically, and it checks it based on rules that you set under your scripture reference settings. Your scripture reference settings are found under project, scripture reference settings, okay? So this is a new feature that came in Paratext 7.6 that you can define you can define what a valid scripture reference looks like. Okay, it's going to tell you probably that Mark has changed, and I'm going to save mine. Okay. When you look at this scripture reference setting, the first, there's three tabs that open up. The first tab that's visible is the one that tells what a legitimate scripture reference should be. Okay, so it tells me what character I'm using for a chapter verse marker. Now right now it's telling me that I'm using a period, but in my reference that I wrote, I used a colon. Okay? One of the things that you as a team, you as a translation coordinator, have to work with the teams to decide is what is a valid scripture reference? How is it defined? Again, there's a guide on the side that takes us through what these things are. In this case, I'm going to change the period to a colon. There's a number of things that, that are here, and some of them depend on spaces. So in some languages, you would put a space after the comma if it's verse 1, comma 3. And when you do this, Paratext shows you what that's going to look like. So you can look at it and say, nah, no, we don't want the space after, the, after that. So let's take the space back out. OK? 
Okay. Yeah, that's the way we want it to look. Okay. Again, I'm not going to go through all of these different parts because there's a guide that shows you what these parts are. What I want you to notice is that this is where you set this information. Okay? This is where you set the information. <coughs> and again, the guide will give you some help with it. You also set the book names in this table. So under the book names, it's filled in. Now, if you're starting out a project that's never been dealt with before, this might be totally blank for you. Okay? So you have some choices. One, you can copy the information from another book. So you could copy the book names and say, I want to copy the same book names that they used in the Nafanra. I'm going to copy those into this project. Or I'm going to copy the ones that were used in XYZ project. But if you don't have something that you can copy from, then the only way to get these in here is to type them in. No, any project can copy. Unregistered. Yeah, unregistered can copy. Anybody can copy. But Lynn? It doesn't say it, but it looks like they're suggesting a, an M dash for page names. Yes. Instead of an N dash? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Or I'm going to go to this passage. Now it's wrong again, right? So now I need to change this because it should be Matthew with all caps. Now when I type in Matthew with all caps, then it corrects itself and says, okay, that's good. That's the way it's supposed to be. So it goes through the references for me and it verifies that this reference is actually correct. Okay. Okay. okay, so this works here, and actually it can work any place that I put an XT marker. So one of the things that happens is if I put in a cross-reference, so let's say I wanted to put a cross-reference here to this, in this verse and said this is a reference, cross-reference, this is a reference to Matt 3, 13. Okay. Again, it's wrong because of the fact that my rule says that the short name, which is what, the brief, what this is using, the short name is supposed to be Matthew. So I would have to type it Matthew, and now it marks it as correct. Okay. When I do a footnote, if I come to this footnote and I say, okay, this includes Matthew 3.13, you'll notice that Matthew 3.13, is, it's the right format because it's the same format as I had, but it's not getting highlighted, it's not getting marked with the little book symbol because it's in a footnote. Footnotes don't get checked. So what I would have to do is mark this with an ST marker. If I put an XT marker in front of it, now Paratext is checking it and making sure that it's right. Okay. So one of the things that's new in Paratext 8 is this ability to use this reference check that's actually going on all the time. Okay, to verify that this is a correct format. Okay, but it only checks the formats if they're XT or the R series of markers. Those don't have to be the same. You could use abbreviations for the XTs, and you could use parallel, you know, the short name for the parallels. You can do it however you want, but it will check to make sure they're consistent. Any questions on that? I'm going to show you one last thing before we break for 3 o'clock. This is a feature that I'm pretty sure is new in 7.6. It might have been there in 7.5. But that is the ability to insert a whole series of cross-references into a project. So in this project, I don't have all my cross-references, and I want all the cross-references that I can get, because I want people to see the cross-references. Under Tools, there is a feature here called Cross-Reference, Insert Cross-Reference. Cross-Reference, Insert Cross-Reference. And what it does is it, again, has a guide that tells me what it does, so the guide's a good place to start. But what it does is it allows me to select a file from a choice, and, and the current choices that are there are the UBS New Testament list, the UBS New Testament and Old Testament list, or the UBS New Testament and Old Testament Deuterocanonical list. Okay? So there's three lists of references. Okay? One that includes the Old Testament and New Testament, one that's just New Testament, one that's all, the whole Bible. I'm going to choose the New Testament and Old Testament list, And it gives me some copyright information there. Basically, these came out of the Good News um, translation, the GNT. And um, basically, everybody who has a license for Paratext has the right to use this. So if you have a Paratext license, you can use this. There's several choices here. One is delete all existing cross-references. So if I've already got some cross-references in there, do I want to get rid of them before I do this process? 
I don't know. Maybe. That means every single one, not just ones. This is everything. This is this is everything. So either you, either you do them all or none. So this is a tool that I suggest that gets used kind of you know carefully. Um, omit references to verses that are not in the project. So let's say I don't have any of the prophets. Then I could say, okay, don't put references to Jeremiah in, in here because I don't have it. Only put references to Genesis, Exodus, and the books that I have. So I can choose whether I want to omit ones that I don't have. And add a colon to the XO field. That means at the end of XO, some languages, they say 318 colon. You know, 59 colon. A lot of people don't do that. So you can add a colon or not. Okay. I click OK. And notice it didn't ask me, well, what books do you want to do? What, OK, this just, this knows this is my project, and it's going to do it. So this is a feature that exists that allows you to insert a bunch of cross-references all at one time. Okay. There was another feature there that said extract cross-references. So you could go through and extract them out of another project and insert them if you have permission to do that. We have permission to use this list. One of the things that you'll notice happens here is that it put in the names as it existed in my scripture reference setting. So it's smart enough to know what my structure is, what my format, what my names are. So Mark is spelled that way. Matthew is the one that we spelled with all caps, so it put it all caps. So it's going to take whatever I've done, and it's going to put them in. Now, let's say I did that, and I said, oh, Matthew's not supposed to be all cap. Okay, that was, whose idea was that anyway? So I can go back, I can look at my scripture reference settings, find book names, Matthew, fix it. Oops, okay, helps if I spell it right. Okay, fix it. Now, when I go to tools, insert cross-references, wherever that is, Tools, cross-references, insert cross-references. I still have to choose the list again. But now I'm going to go ahead and delete all the existing ones because I messed up with the insertion before. So now I'm going to delete the ones that I inserted. But this would also delete any that I had manually added. So I have to be careful, decide, what do I want to do? Yeah, I want to do that. Are you sure you want to delete all of them? This is. You know, anytime you're going to do something that's going to affect paratext, usually it's, it's going to, are you sure? Especially if you're deleting something that you did. Okay, yeah, sure, go ahead. And it goes through and it actually fixed my Matthew so that everything's right. So, so I can go back and redo this to make it right. Okay, break time. Hold your question. Neil, if you would take those who need to go get their badges over to Ron Barkey. If you need... Yeah, so I think it's just, yeah. Can you, can you ask him for a, a card for Kaviti as well? Sure. I, I didn't give Kaviti's card to anybody, did I? Okay. So he's not going with me. He's not going. He's got to go pick up his, his, okay. his card. Okay. okay. We will pick up again in about 15 minutes. Okay, so for those of you who are listening online, we are stopping the stream right now, and we'll be back in about 15 minutes.